Hi everyone. If you're one of my regular viewers and subscribers on YouTube, uh, this video is actually geared towards my students at Parkland College and it's going to be an anatomy lesson on the lathes that we have here in the machine shop. So if you're not interested in that, uh, you don't need to watch this video. If you happen to own a quasi-mitosa lathe and would like a little bit of background on the controls and how to uh, use them properly, uh, go ahead and keep on watching. You'll find this informative. The first thing we're going to be talking about in this video is how to change speeds on the machine. And you need to worry about this chart right here. This is our RPM chart. And you can see it says ABC down the side, which is this handle. You have A, B, and C. And then you have 1, 2, and 3, which is this handle over here. You also have Roman numerals 1 and 2, and that is high and low. So Roman numeral 1 is low, and it's this switch back here, the yellow one. It's a two-speed motor, so if you switch it into low, it's half as fast as high. If you needed it to be in high, you would flip it over there. So let's say we wanted to be at 30 RPM on this machine. Now 30 is in the A1 column, so you would have to get that into A. A lot of times you have to move the chuck in order to uh, get it to mesh into gear. And then this handle is the oddball of the machine. You actually have to tilt it out like this in order to move it into position. And again, you may or may not have to move the, uh, uh, the chuck in order to get it to mesh. Then you would have to make sure that this was flipped to low speed because it's the Roman numeral 1 column. Now the machine should be at 30 RPM. Likewise, if we wanted to be at 2000 RPM, we would need to be at C3 and high speed. So we'll switch that to high right now. We'll switch this to C. And again, you have to pull this handle out. That's the only one on the machine that's like that and then you flip that to 3, so we're at C, 3, and high, which is Roman numeral 2, and we should be at 2000 RPM. This will be a little loud. So you can use that technique to find any speed on here. Just make sure that you're in the right ABC location and 1, 2, 3 location, and pay special attention to Roman numerals 1 and 2, which again is low and high. The next thing we're going to talk about is how to change feeds and feed rates. Now, actually, all of these are feed charts. Um, but the ones that are actually the feed rates for the machine are right over here. There's two charts. One is for the cross feed, and you've got an arrow moving across the part on the chart. The other is for the longitudinal feed. You have an arrow moving along the part in the picture. The other feed charts that you see here are for threads per inch, diametral pitch, which is a worm if you were cutting a worm gear. Then you have metric threads. And then you have module, which is the metric version of diametral pitch. These two you might never use, uh, but threads per inch and metric threads you'll be using pretty often in industry. Now all of the charts are listed D, E, F, G, which is this handle up here, and then 1 through 11, which is this transmission handle right here in the middle. Um, now each of the locations is marked with a dot. On this transmission, the one location is right here uh, in this bottom slot, and there is no gear location all the way to the left. So it would be 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You also have these three handles here that choose which type of feed you're doing. For power feed on the lathe, you will have all three of them all the way to the left. If you were cutting threads per inch, you would need to have all of them at the TPI location. Likewise, uh, metric threads, they would all have to say M. And if you were ever doing uh, module or diametral pitch, uh, you would just need to have the handle set at that particular location. So here's a close up of the feed chart for power feed. And again, this chart here with the arrow moving across the part is for cross feed. And then this chart here with the arrow moving along the part is for 
uh, longitudinal feed. You've got separate settings for each one, and this is a bit of a rarity on lathes. Usually they only give you the longitudinal feed rates, and then they'll give you a key that tells you that the cross feed rates are half of longitudinal or quarter of longitudinal. So this is actually kind of nice, although it can be confusing for people who are new to the machine. So this is just for cross feed, and if you wanted to have two thousandths of an inch per revolution feed rate, you would have to set this at F1. If you were in longitudinal feed, and let's say you wanted to do a roughing cut at eight thousandths per revolution, that would actually be at F2. And if you wanted a finishing cut at four, for instance, you would be at E2. So that's how you read the chart, and then you would just move the handles depending on where they needed to be. Here's a close-up of the threads per inch chart, which you'll be using in this class. And it says TPI, which stands for threads per inch, and likewise you have DEFG and 1311. So if you wanted to cut 24 threads per inch, for instance, you would be at E7 on your handles. You would also have to make sure that the three handles that I showed you earlier that control which type of feeding you're doing would all be on TPI, or threads per inch. So this is the carriage of the lathe, and I'm going to go through all these controls. Now the ones that every lathe has are the longitudinal feed, which moves the carriage back and forth along the ways. You have the cross feed, which moves the tool in and out to control your diameter. And you have the compound, which allows you to cut tapers and angles and chamfers and anything like that. That uh, moves at whatever angle the compound is set at. Now as far as the other controls, this handle engages your power feed, and you've got a couple of options. You can move it up, and it will be longitudinal feed. There's a picture here that you may or may not be able to see on the camera that has an arrow moving along the part, just like on your feed rate chart. If you move it down, that is your cross feed. So you've got a picture down here that shows the arrow moving across the part, just like on your feed chart. This handle right here are your half nuts. These are what you use for threading, and it's literally two halves of a nut that clamps onto the lead screw of the machine and feeds for threading. You also have an emergency stop right here. Hopefully you won't need it. The emergency stop button tends to cause some confusion with people uh, because occasionally someone will bump it or hit it, and then someone comes to find me in class and say that their lathe isn't working and all it is is that someone has hit the e-stop button and the power is cut off to the machine. So you just have to turn it until it pops back out. This is the power switch for the machine and you have to pull this plunger out like this and then go up for one direction or down for the other. This lathe also has an oiling system for the carriage. If you pull that plunger out, it will oil the ways of the machine under the carriage. Now we actually have two different vintages of Clausing Matosa lathes in here, and in between when we ordered them, they changed the location of the threading dial. So some of the machines have the threading dial here on the left-hand side of the carriage next to the longitudinal wheel, and some of them have it on the opposite side. So this is the other location of the threading dial, and it's over here next to the half nuts, which actually makes it a little more convenient for you. Um, so this is on just one of the closing Matosa lathes, but if you're looking for it on the left-hand side and you don't see it, well, there it is by the e-stop. So I'd like to also talk about a pitfall of this particular machine, the closing Matosa lathe and it has to do with the carriage handle. If I engage my longitudinal feed, now my carriage is feeding towards the chuck. If I were to pull out on this handle to disengage it and move it down, I could very easily go right into cross feed, which would then start digging the tool into the part. So if you're doing longitudinal feed on this machine, you can just push it straight down and let it snap back in, and then it will shut off the feed. Um, so be careful when disengaging. 
you don't want to pull out on the handle because you could very easily make it go into crossfeed and ruin your part. The tail stocks on these machines are pretty similar to any other tail stock you'll come across. Uh, the locking mechanism for the tail stock is right here and it's a cam lock. Just move this to the vertical position and it locks the tail stock from moving. You also have your quill handle of course that moves the quill in and out. This handle here is a lock for the quill so if you were using a live center to support the end of your stock you would get it into place and lock this quill otherwise you leave it loose. The tailstock quill has a dial that you can zero in any position. The witness mark for it is up here on top. Each mark on the dial reads two thousandths of an inch. So you have two, four, six, eight, ten. Um, that can cause some confusion if someone's trying to drill to a certain depth. If they think that it's uh, one thousandth per mark, they end up drilling twice as deep as they need to. So just be aware of that. And it's just like any of the other dials on the machine. You can hold the handle steady and zero it in any spot. The taper in the tailstock quill is a Morse 3 for this machine and that is the same as every other lathe in the shop except for the large LeBlanc which we'll do in a separate video. So if you're putting your live center or your drill chuck in make sure it has a Morse 3 and then give it a good smack inwards just like that to seat it. On the closing Matosa lathe, probably 95% of the time that you have a problem with either the spindle not turning or the carriage not feeding, it has to do with one of these handles not being in the right position, and it could be any of them here. So uh, with feed rate, it's going to be one of the feed handles, so either the DEFG handle's not in position, the transmission handle's not in position, or one of these three is not in the correct position. If the spindle isn't turning, then it would have to do with one of these handles, the speed handles. So one of those might not be in position. Most of the time with this one, since you have to pull it out in order to turn it into position, if it's not quite in gear, you'll actually see it angled like this. Um, if it's all the way in, it'll be like this. And uh, there is a detent at each position, so you should be able to feel it when it snaps into that position. The other handle that I didn't really talk about is this one, which is feed direction. Uh, we don't want you to change this unless you're knurling or cutting left-handed threads. Uh, those are the only reasons you should ever really have it in reverse. All of the lathes in the shop have some sort of electrical shutoff on the back side of the lathe. Most of them look like this, the yellow and red lockout tag out. And if you can see the hole through the gap in the yellow bit there, that is the off position. That's so you could put a padlock on there and shut off the power to the machine so that you can work on it. A lot of times people will come up and say that their machine's not working and it's because someone for some odd reason has turned off the shutoff on the back. <laughs> 